16. I want to stretch down to verse number 14, 1 to 14. And for those who didn't read anything this morning, maybe we read all 19 verses. Amen. Psalm 116. 116, then we will read. I love the Lord because He had heard my voice and my supplications. The sorrows of death compassed me, compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I call, then call I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with me. For thou hast delivered my soul from death my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In, in the, the courts, courts of the Lord's house, house in, in the, the midst, midst of thee, thee O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, praise ye the, the Lord. Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your people here this morning. We pray your favor, your grace, and your blessings upon them. We pray this morning, Father, that you would bless your word, that you would bless feeble lips of clay, that they would speak as the oracles of God. Open our understanding that we would understand your word. And to you we will give glory and praise for all that you've done and will continue to do. We honor you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. And praise God. Please be seated in the presence of the Lord. Verse 14, I think, is a very, very interesting verse. And I want to look at verse 14. In fact, verse number, verse 12, in fact, is a verse that I want to really lay some emphasis on. What shall I render to the Lord. What shall I render to the Lord? David is talking about uh, things that, you know, you need to do for the Lord. What shall I render to the Lord? Hallelujah. Think about it for a moment or two. What shall I render to the Lord? What shall I render to the Lord? And see what, it, what is coming up in your mind, in your spirit. What shall I render to the Lord? God, what, what shall I render to the Lord? to the Lord. But all that he has done for me, what shall I render to the Lord? One of the things I like about our God is the fact that he doesn't place impossible demands on us. That's what I like about our God. He doesn't place impossible demands on us. Whatever God requires from us, we have the capacity to deliver. Let me say that again. Whatever God demands from us, we have the capacity to deliver. Because God is not going to ask you to do something that is impossible. Impossible things belong to the Lord. God will de deal with the impossible things. But whatever God wants us to do, whatever God requires us to do, God knows that we have the capacity to get it done. 
to get it done. So that the thing that God is asking you to do, asking me to do, God is aware that we can do it, that we can get it done. Sometimes we allow the devil to say to us that you're not good enough. Always remember, my dear brothers and sisters, that the devil is a liar. He is the father of lies. You don't have to believe a word from the devil. You believe the word of God. You believe the word of God. So whatever God requires from us, we have the capacity to deliver. We must not allow the enemy to back us into a corner and have us think that we are too small. We're not too small. Jeremiah said, God, when God spoke to Jeremiah and called him, he said, God, I am just a child. God said, don't say, Jeremiah, that you are a child. God said, I have made you a prophet unto the nations. Here is Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, is belittling himself, despising his potential by declaring to the Lord that he is a child. He can make it. And God said, don't look at yourself in that light. Don't look at yourself in, in that light. There might have been failures in the past. There might have been bad experiences in the past. But you don't allow the past to dictate the present nor the future. Because you don't know what God is going to do with you. Once you submit your life to Him, God will take care of you and grant you the desires of your heart. And so the enemy would back us into a corner and have us think that we are too small or we lack the ability to do what God wants. We don't lack the ability. We have the ability. It's just for us to use what God has given unto us. There's some of us God has given one talent. There's some of us God has given two talents. There's some of us God has given three talents. There's some of us He's given four, five but the, the, the point is that whatever God has given to you, use it for the kingdom and the glory of God. Be the best you can. Be the best you can. Be the best you can. There are not too many knowledgeable men or women who, who God called to the ministry. God has a way of taking the broken. And I want you to get this. He has a way of taking the broken, the forgotten and the ones who think that they are not good enough and make them champions. I don't know if you can put yourself in that verse and say, this is me, this is me, this is me. God has a way of taking the broken, the forgotten, and the ones who think that they are not good enough and make them champions. Why God would do something like that? Because you see, at the end of the day, you know that it was not you it was God because if it was you, you would not have gotten where you are. But because God has lifted you up, lifted you up from where you were and brought you to a place where you can say, it was God in the first place who did all of this for me. Hallelujah. You see, when you have all the knowledge and all the skills, you don't need God. When you have all the know-how, you really don't need him. But when you know that if it wasn't for God, that you would have been a failure and a miserable one too. But God has done a wonderful job. <laughs> oh boy, that was a wonderful one. <laughs> so God has, God has not called too many people to the ministry with tremendous knowledge. Because there is that tendency, that proclivity by man to, to take the glory. It is me. I did it. I was the one. But God wants us to depend upon Him. And when we depend upon God, God will work in ways beyond our own imagination. When you know that if it wasn't for the Lord on your side, you would have been destroyed by the toxic declarations by the devil and his agents. People declaring things over your life. You will never be good. You will never amount to anything. The devil is a liar. You will never be better than your father. The devil is a liar. You've got to get to the place in your life where you're not believing that stuff. And if people keep talking like that to you, you move away from folk who talk like that. You move away from people who talk like that. You don't want to be around people that are that feeding you poison all the time. The poison will eventually get you and kill you. You want to be around people who would speak into your life uh, something that can take you from one level to another level. Are you hearing me this morning, saints? 
And so you don't knock around people with these negative and toxic declarations. The devil is already toxic, and you don't want to connect with toxic people. You want to make sure you connect with people going someplace. There is a saying, iron does what? And if you're trying to get yourself sharpened, and you, you're rubbing the grains against grass, you ain't going to get no place. The text is asking us a question, what shall I render to the Lord? David had to answer this question. He was conscious that God was responsible for his success. He also knew that his father and brothers did not see the makings of a king in him. Oh, I don't know if you can get that. They did not see the making of a king in him. Let me make it a little more, bring it a little closer to us. They did not see... 107 27 Tucker Street in us when we were in the school. They didn't see that. Some of us even here didn't even see that there was a 107 207 Tucker Street when we were in the basement of the Isaacs residence. But you see, you could get to the place in your mind where you shut yourself down and shut yourself out. You've got to be able to see beyond your present reality that God is able to bring you into your destiny, into your purpose, uh, that this, what is happening to you now is not where your life is going to end. And if you can see it in that light, you know for sure that whatever happens to you is just a phase you're going through. And God is bringing you through this phase with flying colors. Hallelujah. So they did not see. Jesse did not see. Jesse. <laughs> Hear that one there? Jesse. No, this is Pauline Ezekiel we're talking about. Jesse did not see. The father of David did not see in his son, his last son, that there was a king in him. But God saw in David that there was a king. There was a king sitting in David. I don't know this morning what is sitting inside of you. I don't know, but God knows. And I am hoping and trusting the Lord that you would not kill what is inside of you. You would allow it to grow so that you can be what God wants you to be. That this world would benefit from the gifts that God has placed in your life. David's father did not see. He knew that his father and brothers did not see the makings of a king in him. To them, he was just another shepherd who was placed in the pasture and not the palace. They couldn't see the palace. They saw the pasture. You know there's some people who write your destiny for you? You can't allow anybody to write your destiny for you. You have to allow God to write your destiny. They saw him in the pasture, but God saw him in the palace. That's the difference. They saw him in the pasture, but God saw him in the palace. Tell yourself, I am not only in this pasture. I am, I am bigger than this pasture. My potential is not for this pasture. This is just a temporary move. I am moving to something that is greater and more permanent and more blessed. I'm moving from the pasture to the palace. I'm moving. I'm moving from the pasture to the palace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My mentality is not going to be pasture mentality. My mentality is going to be palace mentality because God has greater things in store for me. The Bible says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of man the things which God has prepared for them who love him. Now, if your eyes have not seen it, your ears have not heard it, and God is saying, I have great things in store for you. I am just walking with him. God, let this great stuff manifest itself. Let this great stuff manifest itself. Every experience that you have in life, see it as temporary. That this is not the sum total of your life. This is not where your life is going to end up. Your life is going to end up where God wants it. Better things are in store. So when the question arose, what shall I render to the Lord? He knew that he had many things to thank God for. Number one, he had to thank God that when his father and brothers rejected him, that God did not reject him. 
Hallelujah. Sometimes as parents, we could play this dangerous game. We love some more than the others. That's a terrible thing to do as a parent. The moment you convey that to your children, let me tell you what they'll do. They'll remember it for the rest of their life. They will never forget it. So you tell every one of them, you're my favorite child. You're my favorite daughter. Every one of them come up, when this one come to you today, you're my favorite child. When the other one come in the office, you're my favorite child. When the other one show up, you're my favorite child. But will all of us be favorite? All of you are favorite. Are you hearing me this morning? Because let me tell you, when you, when, when you try to, to, to put one down and lift the other one up, uh, it is going to backfire at some point in time. I believe if Jesse knew that David was going to become king, he would have treated David differently. Because when Samuel said, is there another one in this house? He said, well, we got one more day you know, in the pasture. To Jesse, his whole disposition, his whole attitude never reflected that of somebody who anticipated that his son was going to be anointed king. After Eliab, who was tall and handsome, was, uh, was rejected by, by, by Samuel, and he went through the line, all of these boys, uh, Samuel, God said, not this one, not that one, not the other one, not the other one. By that time, Samuel is worried because he's down to the last one in the house, uh, and God is saying to him about this one, I have not chosen this one too. And at that point in time, no doubt Samuel is wondering whether he heard from God. And God said, ask Jesse if he has another son because I know he got another son. And when he asked him, he said, well, he's out there with them sheep in the pasture. And Samuel said, fetch him, let him come. And the moment he came into the presence of Samuel, there was a connection between Samuel and David. He knew that this was the anointed of God. And he took the, the horn and he poured the oil upon his head and anointed him to become king. There was a gap between the anointing and the coronation because God had to prepare David for the next level. And even though he was anointed king, he didn't step on the throne immediately. God had to prepare him. God would prepare you, prepare me for the next level of favor and blessing that he has in store. We had to be in the basement. We had to move from the basement to the school. We had to go through walking in mud and, 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 and lifting up equipment and packing up chairs and taking down chairs and doing all of this stuff uh, so that we can appreciate where we are today and give God praise and thanks uh, that even during the winter when it is cold, when it is hot, uh, that we are comfortable in this place. Are you hearing me? Are you feeling a brother this morning, saints? God will prepare us. He will prepare us. He will prepare us so that when we get to the place He wants us to be, we will not take Him for granted or take anything that God has done for us for granted. There is that tendency in human nature to take God for granted and the things that God has done for granted, but God don't want us to do that. He wants us to be able to be grateful. God, I thank you. You could have chosen somebody else, but God, you've chosen me, and therefore I am thanking you. I don't even know why you did it, but God, I am not questioning your wisdom I just want to thank you for what you have done I just want to thank you for what you have done and so he says what shall I render to the Lord and so he knew that he had many things to thank God for notwithstanding that God spared his life when Saul wanted him dead you remember that Saul wanted him dead because Saul knew that God was replacing him with David can you recall incidents in your life when you were in serious danger and somehow you were able to survive? Can you recall any incident where you were in serious danger and if God didn't come to your rescue, you would have been in major, major trouble? So you've got everything to thank God for. Undoubtedly, it had to be the hands of God at work on your behalf. And so there are a few things I believe we can render to the Lord. Number one, the first thing we can render to the Lord is service. We can render service to the Lord. Service to the Lord. The first thing we can render to the Lord is dedicated service. Especially when you think of the great need in the church and in the world today. I can render service to the Lord. I can render service to the Lord. Render service to the Lord. In these days, you've got to pay people to do everything they do in church. 
there was a days when we uh, there was there was a time when we volunteer and the, the only person who was paid in church was the pastor everybody else rendered service to the Lord rendered service to the Lord those days are gone if you don't pay some folk you can get stuff done but I came up in a time in the church where it was your desire to serve you felt honored to be serving in the church I cleaned the floor I cleaned the toilet I, I polished the, 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 the chairs, the benches, the pews, uh, did all of that stuff without pay. And not only that, uh, but then you had some folk who would come around, see me doing it, uh, and they start making all kinds of slight comments. Mm, big lazy fellow, we ain't going to find some work to do. They didn't see service in the house of the Lord as service unto God. Let me tell you something. Jesus says... Uh, if you are faithful in the little things, God said, then I will make you ruler over great things or many things. If I don't display dedication, faithfulness in the little things that I have to do that you might consider little, but God doesn't see it as little. He sees it as important. If you don't dedicate that level of faithfulness and commitment, God is not going to release you into big stuff. Because he knows the day he released you into big stuff, pride is going to take you over. Pride is going to take you over. You are going to trip yourself up. And so our service must come from the heart. It must come from the heart. It must cost us something for it to be meaningful. When Arnon offered David the threshing hook and the instruments and the floor and everything he needed to sacrifice unto the Lord, David said, I will not offer God that which doesn't cost me something. It must come from the heart. It must come from the heart. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus is explaining, a com the, explaining the complexity of service. He said that if any man will come after me, let him do number one. What? Deny himself. Let him deny himself. Do what? Take up, Take his, up cross. his cross. And do what? Follow and follow me. The hardest thing for us to do as human beings is to deny ourselves. That's the hardest thing. We can deny other people. But when it comes to denying ourselves, you forget it. It ain't happening. So in, this, in that verse, there are three significant things that emerge which should pay, we should pay critical attention to. Number one, denial of self. It is one of the hardest things for human beings to do, giving up your rights for the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God requires an abiding faith in God and His Word. And so it's one of the hardest things for us to do. The Greek word for denial is aprokomi, which means to deny, disown, or renounce. It is turning away from idolatry or self-centeredness and every attempt to orient your life by self-interest. Look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I what? Live. I live. I am crucified. He is all and all to me. I am alive, but I live in Christ. I am covered by Him. My life is not my own anymore because I belong to Him. I was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. I am a peculiar person because of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. So I am not living in my own wisdom, in my own knowledge, in my own strength, in my own power. I'm living in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a place of victory. Amen. It is a place of victory. It is a place of victory. It is a place of victory. And the second thing he says in that verse, take up your cross. Take up your cross. I remember on our anniversary, I was given a big cross. I have it in my, on my desk. 
And the, I mean, dangling in front of me, a big cross. That looked very nice like an archbishop today. But you know, the wearing of a cross in the Christian church was not during the time of Jesus. Let me tell you where that, when it happened. It happened three centuries after the Lord Jesus Christ went back. When Constantine, that emperor, it was during the time of Constantine, people started to wear crosses around the church. In fact, if you were a good Bible, Bible, Bible student, you would discover that there is nowhere in the scripture that you are required or com commanded to wear a cross. Oh, well, y'all gone quiet now. There is nowhere in the scripture, nowhere, nowhere from Genesis to Revelation that you will find any instruction that you as a believer or a minister got to wear a cross. Oh, y'all gone quiet. You thought it's in the scripture. It's not in the scripture. We do so many things that are not in the scripture and believe that it's in the scripture. So what is the significance of the cross? When Jesus says, take up, said, take up your cross and follow me, he was not talking about putting a cross around your neck and walking about a place with it. What he was talking about is the whole concept of suffering. Oh, let me, let me, let me spend a little minute or two down there. He was talking about suffering. Are you willing to suffer for me? Are you willing to, to go through for me? Are you willing to sacrifice for me? That's what the cross is all about. It is about suffering. It is about sacrifice. Because when you think about the cross that Jesus went on, that it was sacrifice. He was nailed on the cross as a sacrifice for my sin, for your sin, for the sin of the world, so that we would be delivered from sin and the control of sin and the penalty of sin. So taking up your cross doesn't mean wearing a cross around your neck. I'll have a problem if you want to wear your cross. Wear your cross if you want to wear it. In fact, there were, and I said there is no evidence. So when Jesus said, take up your cross, this is what he meant. One, a willingness to lose some of your closest friends. I'm saying it very softly and easy. A willingness. Are you willing to give up some people for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are people so important to you more than God and the things of the Lord? That's what he's talking about. He's saying to the disciples, you remember when Peter said, Jesus, do all men who forsake you. I, Peter, I, Peter, who come from Clarendon, will not forget you. I, Peter, I will not. Peter was a Jamaican. Peter said, I will never forget you. I will never forget you. Pastor, why do you say Peter is Jamaican? Uh, Peter, we put a sword and cut off a man ears. Jesus was right there. And Peter said, oh, you don't mess with the master. Don't mess with the master. I'll take care of you. And she said, Peter, what, what, what's your problem? Jesus went down, picked up the ears and just, the ear, and just put it back on and, and said, Peter, stop it. Behave yourself. This is not how we roll. This is not how we fight. We fight in the spirit, Peter. We fight in the spirit. We fight in the spirit. And the other people laughing. You think that uh, Peter, Peter couldn't be no Guyanese. Guyanese too soft to deal with that kind of situation. Peter, Peter looked at the man and said, you can't mess with the master. We're ready for fight. I had to run. So a willingness to lose some of your closest friends. Number two, a willingness to follow Jesus if it means alienation from your family. Jesus, uh, there's a funny verse. He says if you're not willing to give up father, mother, brother, husband, wife, and this and that. He said, look, you're not really worthy of me. And so when we think about the cross, we must think in terms of sacrifice. Sacrifice. Number three, a willingness to follow Jesus if it means loss of your life. Or your repetition loss of your repetition I think they got it there for you now people will mess with you because you're walking with Jesus when I became I was the first one to get saved in my in my home first one to give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ and my mother made it extremely hard for me to walk with the Lord so when I want to see when you get sick if all them sisters from church will come here come home here to nurse you and God never ever allowed me to ever get sick one of these days you know, in any time to get sick any time and in my mind i was a teenager in my mind i'm wondering well, what kind of stuff is this you should be good you should be glad that your son is walking with jesus 
that you don't have to worry about this one. You don't have to worry about him. He's walking with the Lord. He's not out there selling anything, smoking anything, sniffing anything, or he ain't doing anything that is strange. Are you worried about being in church? Let me tell you, Sunday morning, I was the Sunday school superintendent, and I had to be at church before the children and before my teachers. And on Saturday evening, we lived out in the country. And in, on Saturday evening, I would make sure, because back then, we didn't have a pipe in the yard to get water. You had to go way out, sometimes nearly a half a mile to get to the standpipe. I better thank God that you got running water in your house, that you, you just turn on the water coming. We couldn't turn nothing. We couldn't turn anything. And so you, you're going down the road to the, to the standpipe, and when you get to the standpipe, you always got a story of the standpipe. Who ain't talking about who at the standpipe? As a little boy, you're hearing big folk talking about one another at the standpipe, and you want to know, well, wow, these big people talking so much about each other. But you go to the to dry your water, you can't say anything because in those days, you could get a licking from them. And you could go home to tell your parents that you got a whipping from these folk down there. Those were different days. Those were different days. And so on Saturday evening, I would look at the 45-gallon water drum and realize the water is down. And I would fill that drum up so that on Sunday morning, before I get ready to get to, to church, that I won't be asked to fill the water drum up. And lo and behold, Early Sunday morning, I take a peep of the drum, water gone down, and I know that I'm going to be told, you got to fill this drum up. It was tough. I had to fill it up before I can get out to run down to church. And by the time I'm finished, I, can, oh, I, I can't go in the shower. There was a, a, a trench in front of us, so I just plunge in the trench, come out, get some of those old soapy, I don't remember them soap, those old bar soap in a semicircle. You had a piece of that, you couldn't buy sweet soap, it's too expensive. And you soap yourself up, and you go one time in, and out, and you, you, you run into the place, dry your skin, put on your clothes, and you run in to get to church, because you got to get there on time. You're running to get down to church on time. Let me tell you something. When you honor God, God is going to honor you. He is going to honor you when you honor him. Service is about, the cross is about sacrifice. It's about sacrifice. It is about sacrifice. People mess with your repetition. They will mess with your repetition. Are you willing to allow that to happen? Are you willing? Let me tell you something. Weren't, we to, weren't you told that I stole a million dollars from the Wesleyan Church down the road, uh, uh, the Riggs Road? And they never had a million dollars? The first time they crossed $500,000 at the end of the year is when I came to that church as pastor. So how come you take a million from people who never had a million? It makes no sense. But people will mess with your reputation. Let me, let me tell you, it's a strategy. What is a strategy? If I can ruin your reputation, people hearing that, they will not believe anything that you say, and that becomes a, a hindrance to, to the ministry. You've got to understand the strategy of the devil. I don't have to hit you with a hammer. Let me destroy your reputation. It doesn't have to be true. You know the lady, Sister Daphne? She got another fellow there with Brother Griff from the corner. Let me tell you, people are going to listen to that nonsense uh, and they're going to believe it. And even though they know Sister Daphne and they know that she's not like that, they'll say, but I didn't know Sister Daphne was like that. And the moment they start thinking like that, you know they believe what they heard in the first place. My brothers and sisters, if people have not been wicked to you or been evil to you, why when you hear something that is negative, the first thing you do is believe it. What you got to do is dismiss it and say, let me tell you something. I know this person for all these years. This individual has never been like this. I don't believe a word you say. And you gotta, you got you to finish it off by saying, I will also let Sister Daphne know that you are saying these things about her. And let me tell you what will happen. Immediately you put an end to it. Immediately you put an end to it because they don't want you to go tell Sister Daphne. They're scared. And so you've got to understand how the enemy works. Number four, a willingness to follow Jesus if it means losing your job. A willingness to follow Jesus if it means losing your job. Jesus is saying, look, for you to follow me and be my disciples, you've got to be able to sacrifice. Number five, a willingness to follow Jesus would mean losing your life. 
The apostles, many of them were killed, were crucified. They were, their lives were taken from them. So to follow Jesus, it, and then number three, he says, not only that you, you, you need to, to take up your cross, which is suffering, he says, follow, 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 which means following Jesus means submission, submission to him. Look at Luke 14, 25 to 27. Luke 14, 25 to 27. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father... Now, this is a very funny verse. Look at this verse. Just, just let this verse sit there for a while. I read and call it. And mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. If any... Go back to that verse. If any man come to me and hate not his father. Now when you're reading that in the English translation you believe that you got to hate people. No, 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 no. What Jesus is saying, if you are not willing to make me first to put me first in your life it is good Greek but bad English if you are not willing to put me first I am first. I'm above your mother. I'm above your father. I'm above your wife. I'm above your children. I'm above your brethren. I'm above your sisters. Yea, and even your own life. You cannot be my disciple. It would be a contradiction of Scripture for God to tell you to hate your father and to hate your mother and hate your brethren and hate your wife and hate your children. God is not going to do that. And so the, the, what, what the scripture, what the original text is saying is that God must be first. God must be first. God must be first. Verse 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. If you are not willing to sacrifice on my behalf, on the behalf of the kingdom, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot be my disciple. You cannot be my disciple. He says, it will require you to deny yourself. It will require you to follow me. It will require you to take up your cross, bear your cross. And number four, worship. Worship, worship, worship. He said that we get to the place where we got to worship God. Give God praise and give God thanks for all that he has done. David said, what shall I render to the Lord? Worship. I got to worship him. I got to worship him. I got to worship him. I don't know what you're going through and when you're worshiping the Lord and giving God praise and tears running down your eyes. I am not, your, your cheek, I am not bothered. I just want to join in and help praise God with you because I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what challenges you have. So the text continues to ask the question, what shall I render to the Lord? David was a worshiper. He wrote about 95% of the Psalms. The vast majority of them expressed the way he saw God. He was unafraid to give private and public worship of God. When we find it hard to freely worship God, it's a sign that we are still bound and in need of deliverance. Look at Luke 9, 26. Luke 9, 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. All right, go back to the top of the verse for me. So I can, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his father's, go to the, the other part of the verse. Come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. Jesus said, look, if you're ashamed of me now, you can't bear your cross. You can't make the sacrifices that you need to make for the, the purpose of the kingdom. He says, I am going to be ashamed of you too. I want on that day, whenever that day comes, that I stand before the Lord, I want to hear, well done good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in little stuff. I am making you ruler over many things. My brothers and sisters, my work unto the Lord is not just unto the church. While I love Lighthouse, 
Are you hearing me this morning, saints? Uh, while I love Lighthouse and I love uh, our structure, I love our church, I love uh, our worship and all that God has done for us, uh, my service is not just Lighthouse. Uh, my service transcends Lighthouse. Uh, it is to the Lord Jesus Christ. If it was for Lighthouse, uh, then I would have gone somewhere else looking for money. Are you hearing me this morning? Looking for money. You think it's fun when you're, when you're checking the conga for if I sense inside? Oh, talk to me. You're not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not hearing me this morning. When you look at it and then you see 45 cents inside and you got an earned PhD. Are oh, you not hearing me this morning? It can't be that. While I understand that people attach the, their, their lives to, to those things, my brothers and sisters, it must be service to the Lord. And that is not a cop out for people to hold you in bondage. You, we, we, we must honor the Lord. We must honor the Lord. Here is what, what, what Jesus is saying. Look, you got to be willing to do what he wants you to do. He was not afraid to give private and public worship of God. And so when we find it hard to freely, and I please take note of this, when we find it hard to freely worship God, it is a sign that we are still bound and in need of deliverance. I got to be able to worship God, regardless of what people say, regardless of what people do, I got to worship God. I don't think you dress yourself up this morning, get up out of your bed, when you were in such a deep, sweet sleep, and you were feeling so nice and the pillow paste onto your head and the sheet paste onto your back and the mattress paste onto you and you were in this bed and you, you were dreaming that you were somewhere out in Africa, somewhere out in, in Argentina, somewhere out in New Zealand, somewhere out in Alaska, somewhere out in some other place and you were dreaming and then suddenly you realize it's Sunday morning. I got to get up. I got to get myself out of this bed. I got to get to church. I don't think you left your home this morning to just come see a few people. You came down here this morning because you want to worship God. You want to worship the Lord. You want to worship God. You want to give Him glory and give Him praise and thank Him for what He has done for you. When you're hearing 40-something-year-old young woman died with cancer, Buried, 20-something-year-old young woman I saw at the place there, a doctor's hospital, cancer all over her brain, all over. And I look at her, you won't even know that, she, that she's that sick. And you look at her and you say, oh God, I just got to give you glory. When you are healthy, my brothers and sisters, you, what shall I render to the Lord? Worship. I got to give the Lord worship. I got to give him worship. I got to thank him that I am still in the land of the living what shall I render to the Lord? You, people, people are dying all around you. All kind of tragedies around you. But you are still free of those things. Uh, what is, why can't you not open your mouth? Why can't you not lift your hands and say, God, I bless you because you are such a good God to me. went up to the gas station to get myself gas and I saw this young man on drugs and you realize it messed with his brain. He's there begging for money and I, normally I don't like to give people like that money because they don't know what to do with the money. They just want to take the money, go get another joint or something. And I passed him and he said, oh, can you, do you have any change? I always got change in my car. Always got some coins in the car that I can give him a couple quarters. And I went back and the Lord said, go give him something. I went back and I said to him, man, you've got to do better than this with your life. You can do better than what you're doing here with your life. And I gave him, him some money. And I said, do something good with your life. Don't write your destiny in disregard. You're better than this. You're better than this. You can do better than this. And so when you think, when I think of this young man, I'm looking at him there. I could have been in his situation if it wasn't for the grace of God. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I could have been standing there at the gas station. I don't know, know whether it's Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. All I need is a little some, something. David said, what shall I render to the Lord? He says, I am going 
to worship God. When we praise God, the following takes place in our lives. The glory of God comes down upon us. The glory of God comes down upon us. I was driving the other day, and Jesus and I in the car, and we're having a nice conversation, and a wonderful, His wonderful, sweet anointing, and the sweet aroma of His presence, and I'm saying some things to the Lord, and talking to Him, and sharing my heart with Him, and pouring out my spirit unto the Lord, and God is there just encouraging me, just encouraging me. I have not forgotten you. I have not forsaken you. I have not forgotten you. I have not forsaken you. Those are powerful words. When you're in a tight situation and you need to be encouraged, God says, I have not forsaken you. I have not abandoned you. He is a good God. When we worship the Lord, yokes are broken. When we worship the Lord, yokes are broken. Broken over our lives, broken over our families, broken over our children, broken over our homes, broken over our business, broken over everything about us. So when we worship Him, these are things that are happening. And number three, answers are given to prayer. Answers are given to prayer. Answers are given to prayer. So David said, what shall I render to the Lord? What shall I render to the Lord? The second thing he wanted to do is to be committed to the Lord. He wanted to be committed. He not only wanted to, to worship God, he also wanted to be committed to God. David was conscious that his commitment to God could not be casual or frivolous. His commitment had to be purposeful and deliberate. He remembered the days when Saul was relentlessly pursuing him to kill him, and he witnessed the power of God dismantling all of Saul's plans. This is why we, he wrote the 23rd Psalm. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will do what? Fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You want to go on? Thou do what? Prepare us a table before me in the presence of my friends. Thou preparest a table before me where? In the presence of my enemies, those who wrote you off, those who said you will not amount to anything. God prepared a table. When we're talking about preparing a table, we're talking about stuff that is on the table. We're talking about plenty. We're talking about abundance. We're talking about splendiferous. We're talking about a lot of stuff that God has prepared a table of bountiful stuff. In the presence of my enemy. David answers the question by saying three powerful things. I will take the cup of salvation. He is taking responsibility for his salvation. He is not trusting his destiny to man. Man will fail you, but God will never fail you. He is trusting his destiny in the hand of God. Number two, he says, I will call upon the name of the Lord. In crisis, I will call upon the name of the Lord. In good times, I will call upon the name of the Lord. The good times will not determine when I call. I will call in good times as well as in bad times. Because some of us only call when things are bad. We got to call when things are good too. God, I remember that is you. It is you, Lord. It is you. It is you that brought me to this good season, to this good phase, to this good time in my life. I know the struggle. I know when I used to wear other people's clothes, other people's shoes. I know when they see me with it, they usually look, it's me clothes he got on. I remember, I remember, but God, you brought me to the place where I can wear my own. I can buy my own. I can try it on. I can dress up in my own. Let me tell you something. This preacher that is before you, remember people buying shoes. I got to a funny, my feet, they're funny. My right side is larger than the left side. And people go buy shoe for me and bring the shoe. And the thing, I put it on and I get in dark. I walk in one door. But I had breakfast. Why am I like I can faint? It burning me. And, I, and, I, and I'm trying with it. And I'm doing everything I can to, to survive. And it punishing my, my foot. I'm going to preach. And the shoe is tight. I don't take it off. And I'm walking, people are noise already like you're crazy. Oh, you got on one side and, and you got on the other side. No, I'm not crazy. But let me tell you something. When I thank God that I can get my own. 
I don't despise what people give to me, but by all means, I want to get my own. 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 I want to go and be able to put my foot inside and see if it can fit. If it ain't fitting, I'll leave it. When you are number five in the family, you know what happened back then. You're number five. And stuff just passing down to you. And some of the stuff that passing down to you can't fit you. But they expect you to wear it. I will call upon the name of the Lord. David is conscious that in the time of trouble, only God can save him from destruction. He's committed to seeking God. Number three, I will pay my vows. In the verse says, in the presence of people, He's saying, I'll pay my vows in the public. What are these vows he is talking about? Number one, he vows not to sin against the Lord. Number two, he vows to obey the word of God. Number three, he vows not to forget the laws of the Lord. Number four, he vows to honor the name of the Lord. There are four things. Uh, you see that very quickly. He says, I am not, I'm, I'm vowing not to sin against you, Lord. You've done so much for me. He says, I am vowing to obey your word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Number three, he vows not to forget the laws of the Lord. God, I am going to remember your laws, your statutes, your commands. I'm going to remember them. And number four, he vows to honor the name of the Lord. I prayed with somebody many, many years ago who said, if God deliver me from this spirit of madness, person virtually lost their mind. Go in and out, in and out, in and out. And said, if God, Pastor Cameron, if God deliver me from this condition, I will walk with God. The person who lived just across the road from the church. And I prayed that God would do something for this individual. God heard the prayer. He answered the prayer. He heard what the individual said too. And he answered the prayer. And that person, as far as I know, never made it. A commitment to walk with God. David said, I will never forget you, Lord. I'm going to honor your name. Listen, if you say to God, God, you do this to me, this is what I'm going to do, honor your vows that you made. Because they can come another day, another time, and God is going to remember that what you said the first time you never meant. And don't look for God to come back again and do stuff. Because you've never kept your side of the covenant. God is a covenant keeping God. Let me conclude. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits? David says, I will take a stand for righteousness. I give you the early one for salvation. I will take a stand for righteousness. That's what I'm going to do, Lord. I'm going to take a stand for righteousness. Number two, what, am I, what shall I render to the Lord? I will maintain my integrity as a Christian. Listen, every day you are, you are bombarded by the devil and his agents to give up your conviction, your, your relationship with the Lord. But you've got to decide in your mind, I will maintain my integrity as a Christian. Number three, I will not let the devil use me. What shall I render to the Lord? God, service. But I will not let the devil use me. By the grace of God, I made up my mind, my brothers and sisters, many, many years ago, that I will not let the devil use me. I will not let him use me. Sometimes uh, folk will believe that I'm soft and I'm this and that. That's all right. But let me tell you something. I made up my mind that the devil will not use me. I hear you. I made up my mind that the devil will not use me. If this stuff is not going to glorify God, edify somebody in the kingdom of God, I want nothing to do with it. If it is not going to lift somebody up, if it's not going to lift me up, if it's not going to take me to the place that God wants me to be, I want to, I, I leave it alone. I just leave it alone because it is not edifying me. It is not helping me to grow spiritually. It's not helping me to get deeper in my walk with God. 
It doesn't mean that you don't have to deal with situations. You've got to deal with situations. But my brothers and sisters, in dealing with any situation, I must make sure that the devil is not using me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Number four, I will seek God's presence, not his provision. Oh, that's a powerful one. I will seek God's presence, not his provision. But pastor, God says, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That is true. But if I seek his presence, the provision is going to come. If I seek his presence, the provision is going to come. The Bible says God knows what we stand in need of even before we call and ask. He knows. God says if the, the, there's not one sparrow that can fall from heaven and God doesn't know about it. He says you are of more value than sparrows. I got a canary in my house that I bought five years ago. A canary. It brings pleasure to me when I sit there and hear that canary singing like it never sang before. And when people, and you ask my family, if they're making noise in the kitchen, that canary trying to outsing them to make more noise than them in the kitchen. I have two parakeets in the, in, in, in the kitchen, but they don't, they, all they make is trouble. Make trouble, make mess around the place. But that canary, that canary... That canary brings such joy and pleasure to me. I sit there and listen to that canary. It was not raised in the wild. It was raised in captivity, so I don't know nothing about the wild. If I put it out, I opened the cage one time and it fly around the house. I came right back to the cage. Came right back to the cage. Of course, I locked the kitchen door so he ain't going too far. It gave me trouble to go search him between some shorts or some trousers or something. I will seek God's presence not his provision because the provision will come because of the presence of the Lord Moses said God if you are not going with us don't take us up but if you're going we know that your presence going with us will take care of everything on this journey take care of everything in this journey in these days I feel such a sense of obligation to talk to young preachers and to say to them and when you come into the pulpit, leave your opinion in your seat. Preach the word of the Lord to people. Preach the word of God to people. Help people to, to, to get up from where they are. Help people to move up with God. Help people to be, to be all that God wants them to be. There are two things I said to, to this congregation. When you come into the house of God, number one, you must be what? You must be what? Inspired. Number two, you must be what? edified and by the grace of God we believe that as we do that God is going to help us we must never forget to give God praise and glory for all that he has done for us we must live a life of purposeful commitment to Jesus for the advancement of his kingdom our service our worship and our commitment must not be second rated it must be a demonstration of excellence let me say it again for you we must never forget to give God praise and glory for all that He has done for us. We must live a life of purposeful commitment to Jesus for the advancement of His kingdom. Our service, our worship, and our commitment must not be second rated. It must be a demonstration of excellence. When it is a demonstration of excellence, God gets the glory. What shall I render to the Lord? Worship, service, excellence, and all of these things, God will take care of us. Can you bless the Lord this morning? On this Memorial Eve, what shall I render to the Lord? I just want to make sure that God gets all the glory, and all the praise, and all the honor. He is a faithful you might not even know and understand how blessed we are as a church. There's a guy who bought the building across the road. At the end, they sell body parts of cars. And as you know, there were about nine churches meeting, some Spanish churches, and um, I think two African churches, and a Haitian church. 
And I became very connected to Pastor Joseph. In fact, they're having their anniversary uh, this week here. I'm trusting the Lord that some of you can go across to their anniversary. I plan from tonight until next week they will have their anniversary. It will be the last time they'll be there. The man gave all the churches notice to move out of there because what I noticed they're doing, every module, they're renting it out to commercial people. The churches might pay about $3,000 a month, but the commercial, the business will pay $10,000 a month. So it's all about money. So all of them have to move. All of them, including our dear brother Joseph, would have to move. And this week they have their anniversary. I promise him that we will open our parking lot for him on the, day, the nights that he has, he has his anniversary so they'll be able to park if they need to park. When you think that how God has blessed us, and we don't even sometimes understand. Pastor Joseph bought some land over 10 years ago. And to date, can hardly do anything because the community fighting them and the county fighting them. I remember when Ebenezer was being constructed, I was there when they came and they put a sticker and closed the church down. So y'all can't use the building. And the pastor said to me, he said, Pastor Cameron, I know that you guys are looking to get a church. Don't go buy no land to build no church. From the time we got this land to the time of breaking ground, it took us over 10 years. And during that time, some people are going to lose faith and lose hope and think this thing is not going to happen, that they, the faithful ones are going to stay and sacrifice, the ones on the fence are not going to be there. And the same thing happened to Pastor Joseph. The people, when they moved from somewhere up in Silver Spring, came down here, and some people who left. And trusting the Lord to go over there and to encourage him and to encourage the people that this is not the end of it. God is able. He's able. He's able. We were blessed and real fortunate that in that in six years God help us to get this place that in the seventh year we move in here are you hearing me this morning what shall I render to the Lord I gotta give him thanks and give him praise that he has been a faithful God I feel for my brother I know how it feels to be a pastor and you got to come before the people and say next week, next, next year we're building. Then you get to next year something beyond your control, step up. And you got to tell them, well, the next year. And I listen to one and two of them talk and say, you know, they've been hearing this for the last 10 years. And when you start hearing that, you know that that is not just a few people. It's going around the congregation. And it could mess things up. But we got to understand that if we stay faithful to God, that God is going to take care of us. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you today that we are going to render worship to you. We will take the cup of salvation. God, we will walk with you. We will pay our vows. We will be all that you want us to be. You have been so good to us. You've kept us in health. You've kept us, Lord God, in our right minds. God, we give you praise and give you thanks for who you are. When the enemy came against us to destroy us, God, you raise a standard against him so that he was not able to prevail against us. We honor you today and bless you. May this word continue to resonate in the hearts of your people, oh God, that we will always remember to give you all the glory and all the praise. There was a king in David that Jesse did not see, but God, you saw the king in David, and you made him the second king in Israel. And so God, we give you praise and thanks for all that you're doing for your people. We celebrate your greatness. We celebrate your love. And to you be all the glory and the praise. So those who might be discouraged, oh God, encourage them. May this word be the source of encouragement to your people to look up because, God, you're able. We give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen and praise God.